good evening ladies and gentlemen uh, so you all are all welcome to uh, the village service engineering section committee's uh, uh, public lecture or webinar uh, six webinar organized for this session 2020 21 so this time also we have uh, selected very timely important also very valuable topic but not engineering is something uh, about your health and safety but also equally important like engineering because we all know that now as engineers we all are always working with machines and equipment and their replacement repairs spread profits to maintain the machines the functionality and the efficiency but we hard look at our body servicing systems like your heart your lungs your liver your kidneys also more important than the equipment and machines those are very important engines in the body so we have selected one of the important engine in your body is liver today to discuss and we got a very experienced speaker today with us engineer professor sorry dr professor rohan sirivardhan so without taking too much time i would like to invite engineer sampat godamune to do the introduction and invite dr professor rohan sirivardhan part of the so over to engineer sampat thank you engineer arangode dear colleagues today our guest speaker is professor rohan sirivardhana and our topic is liver disease and transplantation in sri lanka professor rohan sirivardhana completed his primary and secondary education from royal college colombo and he completed his mbbs degree from faculty of medicine university of colombo he was awarded the prestigious pr anthony's gold medal for surgery in year 2006 during his postgraduate period In year 2009 he became fully qualified surgeon and pursued his career as hepatobiliary and liver transplant surgeon. He was a founder member of setting up North Colombo Center for Liver Diseases with his peers at the Faculty of Medicine University of Kalania where they started liver transplantation. Even with limited facilities the team has many achievements to its credit bringing fame and recognition to the University of Kalania. By now they have performed more than 50 successful liver transplants in Sri Lanka including first pediatric liver transplant and first living donor transplant as well dear colleagues you may not aware that approximately 30% of our young population of Sri Lanka has fatty liver which is the first step towards non alcoholic cirrhosis in case if you just ignore it today we have the right person with us to explain more about liver transplant as well as fatty liver which is a silent enemy of our generation dear colleagues please welcome hepatobiliary and liver transplant surgeon professor rohan sirivardhan yes sir uh Uh, Sampat, can you see the screen? Yes, Professor, we can. We can yes, see. Professor, we can see. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sampat, uh, for that uh, uh, introduction. Uh, well, uh, I guess you can hear me. Is my voice adequate, or can you hear me clearly? Yes, very well. Of course, clear. Uh, okay. Uh, well, uh, this is a new experience for me as well because um, I have spoken to. my colleagues in medic medical profession has spoken to students in uh, medical students has spoken to patients but uh, you guys are a different group of people you are uh, well educated i educated and, and and but you your medical uh, background may be a little less uh, compared to other things uh, so uh, how i'm going to pitch this uh, talk i'm not sure but i hope that uh, i'll i'll try some justice uh, for the time that you have given to me so basically during next uh, during next uh, uh, next uh, 40 minutes uh, i would try to take you through uh, the liver as organ to give you a basic understanding about the liver 
and uh, probably I'll try to tell a small story of about uh, how the liver, how the surgery or liver surgery has developed over the last uh, 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 over the last century, and give you uh, some insight into actual medical facts which may be relevant to you as well, and of course. Uh, and uh, the common problems that we encounter and our future challenges with regards to liver transplantation. So uh, when I was uh, getting ready uh, for this talk, I was uh, just trying to compare an engineer with a surgeon. As engineers, what you guys do is you, you strategize, uh, you plan things, you draw drawings, and then you, you, uh, you strategize your approach, and then you revise your strategies, and then you execute your plan. Uh, we also do the same thing, same kind of thing. Before operating a patient, we see whether this patient can be operated, whether he's a good candidate for surgery, and then we plan and we, we, we develop a roadmap. Like, like here, you can see uh, we have reconstructed uh, our images uh, uh, to, to operate a tumor, and, uh, and then we actually execute our plan. Uh, but when I, I thought, okay, Surgeons, as surgeons, we are actually responsible for our patients. If I make a mistake, my patient will die. But as engineers, I, I, I realized that you also do a very, very serious and important job. And if you, if you don't pay attention to your details, and if you, let's say you are an aeronautical engineer, and if you do a suboptimal job, your you, you, you large group of people are at risk. So I think the main important similarity between two groups is that we are accountable for what we do. As surgeons, we are accountable for patients' lives. As, as engineers, you're also accountable to your clients. So that way, I think engineers and surgeons both are similar. Uh, so, but let's, uh, let's, uh, let's move uh, to, uh, to today's topic, surgery. Well, uh, surgery has a long history. Uh, in fact, actually, you can divide surgery uh, into two eras. The era that we don't know, which you can say prehistory. Like, uh, for example, if you look at this skull that, that you see at the uh, left upper corner, this is a skull that was found uh, in, in, uh, in uh, South America, in, in Mayan Empire. Uh, they believe that they have actually made this surgical, uh, you can see tiny holes here, can, they have made these holes in the skull. And they have believed, they think that they have, be, they, they believe that uh, there's evil, so this is believed to be for patients with headaches. And there's an evil spirit that is causing this headache and to take the spirit out, they have made these surgical holes in their skulls. But when you look at Sri Lanka, uh, these, these are actually surgical instruments that were found uh, in Ahana, Alahana Pirivan at, uh, at uh, Polonaru. And these are tiny surgical forceps and this is surgical scalpel and this is a scissor. In fact, this is a small balance they have used to measure the tiny amounts of drugs. So all these are evidence that we have um, about surgery in our country. And then I think you all have heard about King Buddha Dasa. He, it was Mahaman says that he is a great surgeon. And wherever, wherever he travels, they say that he used to carry his surgical scalpel. And they, these are stories, there are stories about how he has treated this uh, snake and cured him. Uh, but when you look at the modern surgery, it actually started uh, in, in 1700 uh, or, or maybe late uh, uh, 1600s, but slowly it was developing. But but by 19, early 1900s and late 1800s, there were main, main, there were two main drawbacks for the development of surgery. Now, one of the main problems was infection. People were dying from infection. And this man, Joseph Lister, he's the one who pioneered and, and, and he devised this carbolic acid sprayer. When they were operating, they, he used this device to spray carbolic acid into the surgical field and that, that drastically reduced the amount of infections. Then this man, he's an American dentist, Thomas Morton, and, and the, main, the second main drawback during that time was uh, there was no anesthesia. And, uh, and people were, surgeons are not able to do great surgeries because the patients cannot be anesthetized, were not uh, anesthetized. And he devised this gadget and uh, uh, he used ether as the first anesthetic agent. And with these two methods, the surgery advanced very fast from in 1900s. And this is a historical theater in early 90s. It is called a theater because it was an act. It was an act of, it's a, it was a heroic act where a surgeon performs this magical thing at the middle. And people used to sit around this and watch this surgery. And that was how the surgery was performed days by, gone by. But today, 
today this is a kind of theater that we are looking at highly sophisticated a lot of theaters a lot lot lot, lot of uh, lot of screens lot of monitoring gadgets lot of instruments lightings and different uh, air conditioning systems and all these have made a great difference to surgery now and but but having said that i think in 50 years time people will look back and say okay these were the surgery these are the kind of theaters that people use sometime back because science is evolving very fast so let's move to the topic today today we are going to briefly discuss about liver and liver is the largest organ in our body and this is a small video actually the video was done by uh, engineer sampath uh, to us and did you I know that there is a factory inside of you yes a factory that runs 24 hours a day it's the heaviest organ with over 500 vital functions this is your liver the liver weighs 1.5 kilograms and it's a soft fleshy organ lying in the right side of the body under the lower ribs it has two main lobes the right and the left it is in close proximity to the gold bladder that lies underneath it and the stomach lying left to it. The location of the liver enables it to receive blood from two sources. Well oxygenated blood from the heart and blood rich in nutrients from the gut. Now by receiving this nutritious blood coming from the intestine, the liver can process it before it gets transported back to the heart and distributed to other parts of the body. If the liver is cut open and viewed under the microscope, we see millions of microscopic hexagonal structures such as these, which are the functional units of the liver. The liver manufactures various proteins, cholesterols and vitamins, and not to forget bile. Bile is this green substance that helps break down fat. Liver also works as a processing unit and a storehouse. The blood can bring harmful toxins and byproducts. Imagine these as criminals, which the liver gets rid of or make it less harmful. So, is it not our duty to keep the liver running smoothly and not to load it with harmful toxins? Yeah, so that's basically if you look at your liver, there are, uh, it's an essential organ, it's the largest organ in our body. It's essential organ. There are a few key functions. Whatever that you take into your body, liver processes that so that it can be used as a different substances and other parts of the uh, organs in your body. And if you get uh, it, it takes off your talk, uh, it takes off the toxins that you take into your body and it stores substances. So, those are the basic functions of the liver in simple terms. And if the liver does not work properly, you cannot live your normal life. So, over the years, the medicine has advanced a lot. And days gone by, one single physician or doctor could practice all types of medicine. But with new advancements, uh, the medicine started branching up, and one such branch is liver surgery. Now, liver, liver medicine, but if you look at actually medical diseases of the liver, you can divide it into two parts. There are certain diseases that you can treat by surgeons, and there are certain diseases that you treat by, uh, that can be treated by physicians. For example, liver infections like hepatitis, Sometimes liver failure, certain drug-induced injuries that you get in the liver. Sometimes your body itself can act against your liver. And these kind of diseases that are treated with drugs, they should be taken care of by liver physicians. And we are a liver surgeon, so liver surgeons look after structural problems in the liver. For example, like liver tumors, there are certain obstructions, certain blockages in the liver, and which can be treated by surgeon, surgery. And, and, uh, and also, when the liver fails at two, after one point, uh, the liver transplantation is basically uh, undertaken by liver surgeons. So most of the time what happens is when uh, you don't people don't realize that there are different specialities, subspecialities. 
So most of the time what happens is, let's say you go to a funeral house and you tell your friend that, okay, I have this liver problem. And your friend says, you uh, know, and go and meet that doctor. And you don't, people don't realize that there are different subspecialities. So what the most important message that I need to give you is that if, if you, if you go and if you are thinking of meeting a super speciality, just don't walk into the consultation. First, it is best if first you meet a general, your general practitioner or general doctor and see, ask him what kind of physician or what kind of doctor I should go and meet. And with a referral letter, it's best that you go and meet the doctor with a referral letter. So, the liver has been a very, very uh, scary organ for doctors, especially for surgeons. Because liver is a highly vascular organ. Even if you make a tiniest cut in the liver, you can bleed to death. Because it is very, very vascular. And actually, even the Greeks, ancient Greeks knew about this. I think you all have heard about Homer's Iliad. And in Iliad, there are two, two main characters. One is Achilles and other, other character is Hector. So it described how, the, how Achilles killed Hector. It says that Achilles stabbed with his sword at the liver. The liver was torn from its place. And from it, the dark blood drenched the fold of his tunic and the Troy's eyes were shrouded in darkness and the light went out. And that is exactly what will happen if you damage your liver. If you make a tiniest cut in your liver, because it is highly vascular, you can be to death. So people, the liver has been a scary organ for a surgeon until recently. But out of all liver surgeries, liver transplantation is the most difficult surgery. It's technically demanding, it's highly demanding surgery. And this is the man, is an American surgeon, Thomas Strasser. He's the man who overcame this fear. And he, but when he started liver transplantation, it was called the surgery of 100 because there was 100% mortality of this surgery because initially people started laughing at him and said, okay, this is not something that is going to succeed. But he knew that this was the treatment and this is the ultimate treatment for liver failure. And he, he continued to develop this. And today, liver transplantation is a lifesaver. And it's a life-saving procedure. Now, right at the bottom, you see a normal liver on the bottom right-hand side. You can see this pinkish color. It's a big organ. You can see the sharp edges. This is your normal liver. But if you look at look at the top, you can see this liver which is shrunken. Then now people, what people generally say is that akma vadiyuna kela again, akma vadiyuna kela. But actually, it doesn't dissolve. When the liver gets cirrhotic, it actually actually it becomes smaller and smaller, and it gets shrunken. It becomes very hard. And you can see this hard shrunken liver which is nodular and this is a damage or cirrhotic liver. Now, cirrhosis is a very, very, very dangerous disease. And you can see these adults, and this is a child with cirrhosis. It's a slow killer. It's a painful death that you get if you become cirrhotic. Initially, people will start complaining of you. The water starts getting collected in your body and pe people initially will start complaining of a little bit of swelling in their legs. But later on, their tummies get puffed up, get filled with water and you become yellow in color. Start People start vomiting blood and losing blood with stools and eventually use your senses and, and it's a slow, painful death. If you, if you get a heart attack, you die suddenly. But in cirrhosis, the death is very, very painful. So, once the liver is gone, once the liver is damaged and cirrhotic, up to a, after a certain point, there is no medicine that can cure liver disease or cure, cure your liver. Only hope for life is to replace, take your damaged liver out and replace with a new liver. So, there are two ways of replacing liver. Now, one is transplanting a full liver. And we know that, I said that liver is essential organ. And we know that the liver cannot be taken completely from a living person. So there are instances where people undergo severe brain injury like in major accidents, major bleeds into the brain and their brains die. But even if their brains die, we have a small window of time, window of time generally about 48 hours. During this time, their heart beats even though their brain is dead. And during this time, we can take these patients' livers out with consent and that can be taken out from the donor 
and here you can see the liver that we have taken out from a donor just before the transplantation and now here we have transplanted that liver uh, into a deceased patient or a, or a patient with cirrhosis and this is the first, uh, first transplantation that we performed in 2011 that was the second in the country the first liver transplantation in Sri Lanka was performed in, uh, uh, in early 2011 by Professor Manjika, Mandika Vijayaratna. We did the second transplant in the country a few months later. But that was after 50 years of the first transplant that, uh, that was performed uh, in, in, uh, in America. So we, we were 50 years behind the rest of the world. There's another way that you can get the liver for transplantation. And liver is a marvelous organ. We are, Unlike any other organ in the body, you can remove 80% of your liver. And even if you remove 80% of your liver, it can regenerate and it can grow, grow back into the normal size. So that is the beauty of your, the liver compared to all the other organs in the body. So using the same principle, liver can be divided into two parts. Here we can see that we have split the liver into two parts. This is the right lobe and this is the left lobe. And you can take this split or remove or separated part and you can implant that into the patient. So this is called a living donor liver transplantation or split liver transplant. And this is technically very, very demanding operation. And we were able to perform the first living donor liver transplantation in Sri Lanka in 2012 where the mother donated part of her liver to the daughter. And in 2020, we were able to perform the first pediatric liver transplantation in the country where again the mother donated part of her liver to a seven-year-old uh, child. So that is a story up to, up to what happened in Sri Lanka. But if you look at the world, the world is far ahead of us. If you look at the total number of liver transplants that are performed in the, in the world, it's about 32,000 transplants were performed in 2017. And large majority of that happens in America. It's about 10,000 transplants annually in America. And the other main player is Europe. Again, another eight to 10,000 transplants. And bit of, again, quite a, quite a number in China. But our, even, our, even India, our neighbor, they perform about 3,500 liver transplants a year. Now in Sri Lanka, we, we do less than 10, 15. Our numbers, if you look at the maximum transplant that we had, the transplants that we have performed in Sri Lanka, it's about 10 to 12 transplants a year. Now, why, why are we lagging behind? Now, when you look at uh, uh, compare liver transplant with other type of surgery, let's say even for, uh, for bowel, surgery for bowel cancer, surgery for breast cancer, if you compare liver transplant with other surgeries, it's a completely different ball game. Now, for liver transplant, it's a highly costly infrastructure is highly costly because for liver transplantation you need dedicated theaters if you are thinking of doing liver live, living donor liver transplants you need twin theaters working simultaneously and a lot of high-tech gadgets are needed uh, to operate on liver and you need specialized other instruments and infrastructure is very very costly and that is the main drawback one of the main drawbacks for us for to develop liver transplantation in sri lanka the other important thing is the trained staff. Now, if you look at another surgery, just a surgeon and the anesthetist is good enough to perform the surgery. But liver transplantation is not like that. You need a big, big team of highly specialized, highly trained people working simultaneously. A large group of trained people, uh, trained specialists are needed. But you need the surgeons, uh, you need a pathologist who look, who look after the liver medically, you need anesthetists who have trained in the liver, intensivists, Transfusion medicine, who, who takes, takes care of liver uh, for, uh, on transfusions, microbiologists, all these people who are highly trained in, in uh, this field. But the thing that happens is it takes a long time for you to train these specialists. At least for me, it took seven years for the training. But what happens most of the time is when you're highly trained and, and when, when, when doctors are sent abroad, they are absorbed by this, their overseas training places and most of our surgeons don't come back. And even if they come back because of the system that we have in Sri Lanka, they get posted to a far away place and they can't practice what they learn and they, they get fed up and then they leave the country. So because of that, this has been another major drawback uh, to develop your transplant in Sri Lanka.
and I, I described about uh, about the organs that the type of organs that we we use for transplantation. I will not go into details of that. But the third and but the fourth most important thing is patience. Now, why uh, why should we talk about this? Now, this is an interesting picture that you have at the top. Now, the top left hand corner. This picture was taken by uh, R. L. Spittle uh, uh, in in uh, early 90s, and these are a group of Vedas. Can you see their? Can you observe their lean bodies uh, that they had? And this is a group of Vedas, uh, recent Vedda picture that was taken recently. And can you can you observe? Can you just have a look at the small pot bellies that they have and unfit bodies that they have? And this again is a picture taken around 1960s, group of youths and lean bodies. But look, let's look at us now. I, I'm not sure some of you guys must be here. Uh, uh, see, ha have a look at the kind of body stature that we have. And this is, a, is becoming a disaster. Now, what is the reason for this? I can remember my grandparents telling that you have to eat a khandavage, but khandakvai khandona to be healthy and that exactly was a type of diet that we had our ancestors they they used big they, they ate a big plate of rice but having eaten that big plate of rice they went to the paddy field and they worked from morning to evening like bulls but what do we do today we, we eat the same plate of rice but they, then we go to the office sit in one place maybe stay at the computer in between we might take a bit of a coke and maybe some cutlets or rolls and maybe french fries sometimes you are really in the mood of eating you might get a you might order mcdonald's and you sit in one place and you gulp all these things and this has made us a very very unhealthy nation now the reason what what is the problem with this now this is a glycemic index of different type of foods that we eat now if you look at white rice if you look at rice the glycemic index is 89%. That means the amount of glucose that is released into your circulation after eating these type of foods. So food like carbohydrate foods, wheat, bread, rice, anything based on uh, wheat, these kind of foods, they contain a very high glycemic index. So what happens when you eat this food? Now the body gets sudden surge of glucose or into your system and the glucose is energy and the body does not know what to do with this excess energy that you take in and and that cannot be you are not spending that energy that you are taking in and the body does not know what to do so that that carbohydrate does get converted to other substances by the liver and one such substances substance that is produced by the body from the glucose that you take you don't have to take a lot of fat you take glucose and the body converts glucose into other substrates. And one such uh, substance is lipids, cholesterol. So you get hypercholesteremia, a high increased cholesterol in your body. And what happens is that this cholesterol gets deposited in, uh, in your body. You are more prone to get heart attacks, more prone to get strokes, more prone to get bleeding into your brain. And you become hypertensive, your blood pressures go up. And you become a diabetic and there are sets, a huge set of other complications that you get because of diabetes. And when you get old, you, are, you, you, don't, you can't think normally, you become dementia. It's called dementia. You start losing your memory. And uh, there is increased cancer risk, especially cancers like colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, cancers in the liver and the kidneys. And if you are a female, your menstruation becomes irregular and then you become uh, subfertile. And the liver, the topic that we are talking today, liver also starts to get damaged. So what happens in the liver? Now this is your normal liver uh, on the corner. And it's pink, uh, nice looking liver. And if you look at this liver under the microscope, this is the appearance that you see pinkish. Uh, uh, these are tiny cells. And uh, that's a normal looking liver. Let's assume that you take this unhealthy diet with a lot of carbohydrates and a lot of energy and the body does not know what to do with this energy and this energy gets deposited in your liver and it is deposited and the body converts this energy into fat because that is the, that is the way that the energy stores your energy excess energy and this fat 
is deposited in your liver and you can see these white white patches uh, compared to the previous picture you can see these white patches and this is uh, the uh, the fat that is got, that has got deposited in your liver cells and this this is called fatty liver fatty liver per se is not harmful if it stops there but the problem is it does not stop there when you keep on eating these fat globules compress your normal cells and it cuts off the blood supply into the liver cells and that damages your uh, liver cells and that is where you call when you do a liver profile or liver enzymes your enzymes will start going up at this phase and when there is persistent damage of your liver cells normal cells get replaced by fibrous tissue and saman sailor tika 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 damage wala gilla eka mender tantu saila kela api kiyanne tantu saila tantu pataka deposit wenawa so now once this happens when the fatty simple fatty liver gets replaced by fibrous tissue this is irreversible even if you stop eating your nice diet it will not go back to normal but if you stop your diet and if you control yourself this can be reversed but from this point onwards from fibrosis onwards it's a progressive damage and if and slowly slowly some of these patients will progress into permanent liver damage or failure which we call cirrhosis and some of the unfortunate patients will develop uh, will develop liver cancer so that is a natural history or that is what will happen to a normal liver if you take your unhealthy diet it will become fatty liver and then slowly it will become fibrotic liver and eventually some of these patients will progress into liver failure or cirrhosis and liver cancer now what is the relevance of these two sri lankans now these are i'm, I'm talking about scientific evidence in kalani we have done a study and we have found out that 35% of sri lankan population has fatty liver that was about 10 years back but our recent study says and it's about 45 to 50% of our urban population has got fatty liver i'm sure if 100 of you guys do ultrasound scan at least 60% of you because this is highly selected group of fish people at least 60% of you will have fatty liver now if you apply this to 35% to sri lankan population you take as 21 million about 7 million will have simple fatty liver and some of them some of them not everyone some of them will progress into uh, liver damage or fibrosis and some of them will progress into liver cirrhosis at the end of the day after about 10 years we will start seeing at least 600 to uh, uh, 0.6 to 0.12 million patients with liver cancer and for given year we will at least in the future i'm talking in the future at least for a year we will start seeing 600000 patients with liver end stage liver disease or liver cirrhosis now if you look at other countries if you look at america the number one cause for liver failure is either alcohol or hepatitis c if you look at uh, uh, if you look at uh, south southeast asia like hong kong japan china the key, the main reason for liver cirrhosis is hepatitis b but if you look at india it's a combination of hepatitis b hepatitis c and little bit of fatty liver but in our country in sri lanka the situation is completely different this is our data during the last 10 years and we have found that 80% of our patients get liver cirrhosis not because of alcohol because of fatty liver progressing into cirrhosis so this is a major problem in sri lanka it is going to, it's already a major problem and it's going to be a major major problem in the future because because our young population is quite unhealthy now and 10 years time significant proportion of these patients will develop this disease and this is going to be a problem in the future now today we talk about mystic kidney disease we we talk about the uh, epidemic of kidney disease in sri lanka and today we are at least 10 to 15 100 patients die because of uh, because of chronic kidney disease and that become an epidemic and we talk about this today and but still the good thing about kidney disease is if your kidneys fail still you can live with dialysis but if your livers fail there is no dialysis it's a slow painful death because there is no way to sustain your life apart from liver transplantation so unless we are careful 
unless we pay some attention on this today, this is going to be something similar to liver uh, kidney disease or epidemic of kidney disease that we see in our country today. So, how to how to address this? Now, I I, I mentioned that this can be treated. This can be prevented. So the best way to treat this is prevent, because once you get liver cirrhosis, there is no way, no treatment that is going to cure, cure liver uh, cirrhosis apart from liver transplantation. But this can be prevented 100%. It is our desires that lead to this problem. Now we know that uh, as, as humans, when we were in our stone ages, we had very limited requirements. We wanted a small shelter, maybe a cave, or to make kill a small animal, and maybe a dig a root, and gather something to eat and reproduce. So that was that were our main uh, requirements, and and the main threats that we had was uh, maybe a bit of uh, threats from uh, uh, wild animals, maybe some rare diseases that uh, that we didn't know about. So there were very little requirements and very very different kind of threats. But over the years, over the centuries and millennia, we have, we have, we have changed, we have evolved. We have built civilizations, our medicine has advanced a lot. And now we are in a capitalistic sort of a type of a society. So here we get a lot of inputs. We look at the TV and we get inputs and, and, and we get so many advertisements and so many temptations. And these, te these advertisements speak into our desires and these provoke our desires. And this desire is the one that, brought, that has brought up these different type of threats to our life. Now, it's a desire that you have to change and it's the most difficult thing to change. Now, the problem I told is increase or, 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 or abnormal intake of carbohydrate. So, what we re recommend for our patients is that 25% of your diet should be carbohydrate. You should not take more than 25% of your diet should not be carbohydrate. So limit your carbohydrate intake. 25% of your diet should be uh, uh, proteins. So proteins are generally harmless in this disease. And 50% of the, your diet should be fruits and vegetables. So what we generally say is that Two meals are good enough for you to, for if you are, if your lifestyle is generally a sedentary. And generally try to avoid taking a heavy meal in the night. Take a light, light diet in the night, uh, uh, something like a soup or maybe some boiled vegetables. So don't take a heavy meal. And your two main meals should be your breakfast and your lunch. In between, try to avoid this taking unnecessary snacks, not to take a lot of sweets which has a very high glycemic index. And for a week, at least three days, at least 20 to 30 minutes, do some exercise. We generally believe that you can eat a bar of uh, chocolate and if you, you walk around your walking path then you can burn these uh, calories that you have take, taken. It's not like that. For you, to, for you to burn the calories that you have taken from bar of chocolate, you have to walk at least half a day. So you can't burn like, you can't, it doesn't work like that. So the first or the most important thing is prevention. But there are certain uh, patients, no matter certain, or most of us, most of us, no matter how much you tell, it's very difficult to change your habits. And, and out of this group, a small percentage of people will progress into cirrhosis. Now, once it's, I, I mentioned earlier, once it progresses into cirrhosis, there is no other treatment apart from liver transplantation. Now, let's look at India. India, I said, has become a country uh, progressing very fast in liver transplantation. Now, for a year, they do about 3,000 liver, 500 liver transplants a year. But in India, liver transplantation is highly commercialized. All these liver transplants that happens in India are done in private hospitals. And half of these transplants are done for overseas patients. So even their number is high. Actually, only half of these transplants that happen in India are done from, for Indians. So this is done for most of the time for overseas patients. And a transplant in India costs about 12 million rupees. Now, that's one model of uh, medicine. 
where the public, private sector has developed and it offers transplantation or it offers a treatment. But if you look at kind of patients that who, that who comes to our OPDs, how many of these patients can afford a, a, a transplant or a medical uh, um, a treatment like that, that is developed in the private sector. So I don't think the option for surgery like this is liver uh, to develop the services in a, in a private hospital. And this is a kind of place that we operate. This is our theater that we do transplant. And this is a kind of facilities that we have in our system. Uh, very basic facilities. We operate in the night. So we are, because we don't have specified theater time, we operate in, operate in the night. And this is the kind of infrastructure that we have today. And this has to be changed. If you don't, if we don't address this now in 10, 15 years time, uh, we will be facing a major problem. We are, so many patients will come to us and we will not have an answer to give to these patients. So after 10 years of hard work, we have finally got some got approval uh, to develop our own place to, uh, to offer these uh, services. So hopefully with time to come, we will be able to cater the needs of this country. Uh, so in summary, uh, so I've mentioned that the liver transplantation or liver is a challenging organ to operate and Sri Lankan younger generation is becoming physically unhealthy and are at risk of developing chronic liver disease. And I mentioned most importantly, the prevention is the best option uh, before it is too late. And of course, uh, the infrastructure has to be developed, uh, improved so that for the unfor unfortunate people who become disease or cirrhotic in the future, even now, they, there is a way to treat these patients. Um, so thank you very much. And I, I believe that you have gathered something out of uh, this talk. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Rohan Sirivardhana. It's very, very valuable presentation with a lot of information. Mostly, I also got a little scared about my behavior, my day-to-day -day practices. So we need to correct ourselves immediately. So I would like to... Uh, hand over to uh, our moderator, Engineer Lakmini, to forward uh, questions uh, from the audience or to manage Q&A from the audience. Engineer Lakmini. Thank you, Engineer Naranguda. So uh, we have received uh, one question at the chat. Uh, it comes, as, uh, comes with three parts. Uh, Professor Rohan, uh, the yeah. first question is, do you recommend to undergo liver biopsy just after observing a high SGPT value, like 300? Okay, yeah. So it's a very, uh, very highly specialized question that uh, that was asked. So gen uh, I'll, I'll give a general answer for that question. Uh, so liver biopsy is uh, the last option that we select. To come to the diagnosis. Um, so basically, if you look at the natural history of uh, uh, the fatty liver, uh, what happens is initially your liver enzymes are normal. And after some time with the liver damage, the enzyme starts going up. And the generally amount of liver enzymes rise that you see is not very high. Generally around 150, maybe that's a rough, rough uh, median that you see. But having said that, there are certain patients who get a uh, little bit higher enzyme levels than that. So the so then now you 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 start uh, the thinking about whether this is something else, whether this is progressing uh, into uh, uh, liver fibrosis. So there are other ways nowadays apart from liver biopsy to diagnose uh, that stage. Like there are something called fibro scan. Uh, there are other ways of diagnosing that. So first, generally we might do that. And then as a final option, looking at the other parameters as well, uh, like other blood reports, uh, um, you might think of doing a liver biopsy. So this is a very highly, highly individualized decision. But sometimes when we can't, if we uh, come to an answer, we might think of doing a liver biopsy. Uh, so uh, to the person who asked the question, you should meet uh, a hepatologist. Um, uh, to take, uh, to, to look after you further. 
Thank you, Professor Rohan. The next part of the question is, is it okay if the SGPD value is in between 40 to 80? Uh, what if it is uh, in between 40 to 80 for more than 10 years? So, okay, it is not normal. <laughs> so, it's uh, your liver enzymes have, really, uh, have gone up. So, uh, yeah, it is not simple fatty liver, but we call NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So, it has gone up a bit. Uh, so, it is not okay. So, uh, but uh, you, it has been stable for the last 10 years. So, that means it is not progressing. So, all the patients who have fatty liver will not progress. Some of them will progress. So, what my advice to the, uh, the person who asked the question is, it's not okay. But it looks like your liver is not progressing. But it's very important that you change your diet. You stick your diet, uh, uh, dietary changes and change uh, your lifestyle as well. The next question is, what are the government hospitals at the moment in Sri Lanka where liver transplant is taken place? Yeah, so liver transplant happens in two places. One, uh, I'm from Ragama. Uh, Ragama, we have done uh, 52 transplants up to now. The other place uh, that, uh, that liver transplant happens is uh, at Colombo National Hospital. Uh, but apart from that, uh, uh, as I can remember, um, Anuradhapura, they have uh, done one transplant sometime back, and Kendi, they have done a couple of transplants uh, a few years back. So basically, but it is happening uh, uh, in, uh, in Ragama and in Colombo. Number three is, what are the tests for check proper liver functions? Uh, I think uh, uh, the uh, if you only think of liver functions, you should do a liver profile. Liver function test, it, it's a liver profile. That, give, that, that has different parameters, uh, different sections in liver profile, different small, small items in liver profile. So liver for profile is... Uh, the first thing that you should do and I, I believe everyone, it's best you can get ultrasound also. So to, you can start with the liver profile and ultrasound scan and depending on that, of course, we decide on other, <coughs> other second line investigations. Next question is, how we decide our situation by serum lipid profile taken report from hospital? Uh, I did get the question. Can, can you just repeat it again? How, how can we decide our situation by serum lipid profile report taken from hospital? Uh, uh, so you, uh, you are talking about uh, the question is on two different things. Lip, uh, uh, lipid profile is uh, something completely different. So lipid profile, let's say you have a fatty liver and your enzymes are high. Uh, now, uh, in these patients, we of course do a liver pro uh, lipid profile. That is because some of these patients who has fat, who have got fatty liver, uh, they they have uh, uh, simultaneous increase in uh, lipid profile as well. So you have to treat both because it is this is called metabolic syndrome. There are four things that goes together. One means fatty liver, hypercholesteremia or increase in cholesterol, and hypertension. And diabetes these four things go together so if you have one if you have fatty liver you have high chance of having uh, hypercholesteremia you have high chance of developing even if you don't have now if you, if you have high chance of developing diabetes and you have high chance of developing hypertension so just when you when, when we get a patient with one of these diseases we check for other things as well what are the early signs of liver di disease and how worried you should be when diagnosed? <laughs> uh, again, uh, uh, open question. Uh, signs of liver disease, uh, so it's a spectrum. Uh, fatty liver is completely asymptomatic. Even if you have fatty liver, you, you will not have any symptoms. So it's a harmless, uh, or you, can, you can't say it's harmless, it does not have symptoms when it is simple fatty liver. But some of these patients, they will progress into liver fibrosis. Again, in the, at the stage of fibrosis, again, you will not have any symptoms. You start developing when your liver becomes, developing symptoms when your liver becomes cirrhotic. 
so this is the time where yeah, you will start developing your legs will start to swell and uh, you will feel uh, lethargic and your eyes might become yellow and and this is the time that these are the signs and indicators of cirrhosis but when you start developing symptoms it is too late you can't do anything for this uh, at that stage you can't treat cirrhosis apart from transplantation so if you if someone starts developing symptoms that means it is too late so that is why it is important at this stage you look into this problem as a problem when you see ultrasound with fatty liver uh, you see you take it as a problem and you attend to that now because when you start developing symptoms it will be too late and you can't treat and actually you don't have now now let's say you you are diagnosed with fatty liver you can't there's no there's no need to go and meet a doctor because most of the 95% of the time you can take care of yourself that is the treatment if your liver enzymes are not elevated of course if your liver enzymes are elevated you should go and meet a hepatologist but if your liver enzymes are not elevated if you have simple fatty liver the most important thing is change your lifestyle and your diet there are no quick fixes most of the time patients come and ask uh, about uh, ask for a drug there are no drugs to change your desire right so you, there are no drugs to treat fatty liver so you eat you get a diarrhea so likewise when you eat you get this problem so you have to control yourself and change yourself otherwise uh, there are no drugs no treat no no medicine which are effective no quick fixes for fatty liver there are certain drugs people have tried people try vitamin e people try other uh, sort of vitamin there are certain fancy drugs but all these are not really drugs of much use so it's up to you that person is under the impression that uh, he is having a fat liver to extend is not that dangerous as it is quite common to have fatty liver at what level do you consider fatty liver is in dangerous level at any level i think it is dangerous <laughs> because because you don't know which one will progress i agree you do a scan if you do scans in 100 60 will have fatty liver but the problem is out of the 60 people you don't know which one is going to progress into the next stage and so so how can you uh, so I, i don't think it's a risk because if it progresses there's no other treatment apart from you know things i have mentioned so are you going to take that risk and continue with what you are doing or are you going to just take your change your lifestyle and and try to be careful with this and and other important thing is fatty liver is not a single disease on its own i told earlier it's it's called metabolic syndrome there are four things that goes together if you get fatty liver you get high chance of getting pressure hypertension if you get you get high chance of getting diabetes and you get high chance of getting hypercholesteremia and of course obesity and all these conditions they lead to other problems you get you, you may not die from you may not die from uh, uh, cirrhosis you might get heart attack you might get a stroke you might get diabetes and lot of complications with that so all this can lead to uh, uh, you know made problems in the future so even if you don't have a problem now it can lead to problems in the future and i think it's it's not a risk that you, that's worth taking next question is please explain little more about the possibility of getting dementia can it be treated uh, uh i'm sorry ring it please explain little more about the possibility of getting dementia can it be treated uh, well uh, it's a different spe- uh, um, speciality i'm not expert to comment on that uh, but uh, fatty liver uh, as it's a combination of a lot of things because of the pressure because of increased uh, glucose because they are getting diabetes uh, their sugars are high it can affect the uh, function of the brain long term but how to treat how effective the treatment is uh, and the outcome of that 
it's a different sort of a different topic and uh, it is best answered by a neurologist so i'm not the best person to answer to that question i'm sorry our next question is there are scary stories of illegal liver snatching from unsuspecting patients is it true uh well there are a lot of scary um, uh, scary uh, stories uh, actually organ transplantation not only liver transplant organ transplantation is a highly sensitive area um uh, uh, a lot of a uh, lot of stories uh, not only stories actually a lot of things uh, there are a lot of ethical issues with regard to liver transplant organ transplantation now a uh, few i'll just uh, point out few few such uh, concerns uh, one is uh, transplantation uh, from living donors i told that liver part of liver can be harvested and transplanted and similarly in kidneys you can take that because there are two kidneys you can take one kidney and uh, and transplant so generally in sri lanka in in there are countries the laws on different countries are different in sri lanka uh, uh, a live anyone can become a live donor so what the usual process is uh, let's say uh, i want to donate my part of my organ part of my kidney or part of my liver to a patient so what happens is i give my consent and then there are certain legal documents and these legal documents are reviewed by a committee and then they approve and the transplantation happens so that's a normal legal process of live organ transplant but the problem is there are a lot of uh, especially if the if the uh, donors are not related there are a lot of financial transactions that happens uh, happens uh, uh, for organ transplantation and this is completely illegal and you can't sell your organs uh, to money uh, for uh, financially it is not allowed and uh, so so because of uh, especially in india there are there are certain instances and there are certain reports it's very well documented uh, people are bully uh, people are actually not bully people are, uh, they 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 sell their organs and they are forced to sell their organs in certain reports uh, have come up that uh, people are forced to sell their organs uh, uh, and uh, in in china uh they take organs from prisoners after ex executing so all these are highly ethically unacceptable and uh, these have happened uh, uh around the world and there are a lot of uh, uh legal change or changes in laws that have come up uh, so in india actually because of this reason they have uh, they have limited life donation only for related donors so if you are not related to your patient you cannot donate and sri lanka uh, recently there were some stories similar uh, to that where uh, uh, commercial donors have come from other countries donate organs so these are all concerns and um, laws have to be changed question is are there any method to observe ourselves the condition of 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 liver whether it is bad or going to be bad how much cost per one liver transplant uh, what is the first question uh, uh, are there any ways to observe are there, are there any method to observe ourselves the condition of our liver whether it is bad or going to be bad okay so basically the question is uh, are there any maybe are there any test or or, or ways to find out whether your, your liver is going to get uh, your liver is damaging Uh, so I, uh, uh, I mentioned earlier the two basic things that you require is a liver profile and ultrasound scan. And I think I, even though none of the guidelines say this, but I believe that if you are a, uh, if you are having a sedentary lifestyle, if you are office worker, if you're not, uh, if you are a bit overweight, it's better to get a liver profile, lipid profile, and ultrasound scan done at least uh, once in every three four years and see whether your liver is becoming fatty or whether your liver enzymes are going up. so i think that's a basic basic thing none of the guidelines would say this but uh, you can meet your general practitioner and ask uh, ask uh, he or she to prescribe uh, for these couple of investigations uh, and and the other question is how much a liver transplant costs 
So liver transplant does not cost in Sri Lanka if it is if it happens in in government sector. Uh, but having said that, there are certain instances where drugs are not available certain times. Um, so people generally sometimes they buy certain drugs when it is not available in the hospital. But generally, it's technically free of charge in state sector. Uh, private sector liver transplant does not happen in Sri Lanka. But if you look at India, India a liver transplant. Uh, will cost about 12 million rupees. In Singapore, it's about 25 million rupees. Uh, but this is the minimum cost. But the problem is uh, a surgery like this is highly technically demanding and, and, a, and, a, and a complex operation. And, and about 20-30% of the people, they get some sort of a complication. But if they get a complication, the cost is, you can't say, okay, this is going to be the cost and you can't put a limit. And I have seen patients who were operated uh, in Singapore and started with 25 million rupees and eventually they, they ended up in uh, with, with a massive sum, uh, a massive amount of money for, by about uh, uh, 60, 70 million rupees eventually. So it can be quite, quite challenging and can be quite expensive if you operate, uh, if you do a transplant in overseas country. Uh, our next, next question is, what are your opinion on tissue engineered liver transplantation and artificial organ transplantation? What okay. the, uh, sorry. Yeah, if you look at the, if you, if you look at the history of organ tra liver transplant, people have tried, uh, it, it started uh, in a different way. Uh, so uh, uh, people thought, okay, you can, not people, actually surgeons and scientists, they, they first experimented with animals. Uh, they tried uh, uh, livers from baboons and livers from pigs and transplanted uh, these, these uh, uh, animal organs uh, and, and uh, tried whether this worked. And actually there are some reports, uh, uh, liver transplanted from a baboon. The patient survived for about four or five days, but eventually the patient died. So they realized that this is not possible. And then only people started experimenting with, uh, with, uh, with uh, humans. So, but, but the problem that they had had at had that time was there were no, uh, anyway, initially live tone liver transplantation was not established. It came way back. It came living tone liver transplantation or taking part of the liver. It came in the 90s. But in the 60s, there was no live donor transplant, so they, they took uh, full livers from dead people. They, are, they did not have criteria to establish brain death. So they, I, I told earlier that, uh, that with, with severe head injuries, you can, your brain can die and your heart is uh, working. So those criteria were not established. But so that was the main problem for organ transplantation at that time, but then they okay with certain legislation. So eventually they found that liver transplantation is possible with, uh, with human livers when the patients are dead. And then late 80s came uh, and 90s, uh, uh, living donor liver transplantation came into picture. And this developed mainly in Eastern part of the uh, of Southeast Asia, China, Japan, Hong Kong, Korea, uh, Taiwan, Singapore, these are the these are the leaders in living donor liver transplantation. So it developed uh, in, uh, in Southeast Asia. But then, uh, then now there are new studies that are coming up, new research that is coming up on artificial livers. So actually, even though, it's, even though technically it says artificial liver, it's not actually artificial liver. So what they do is they, there are different ways of uh, using dead people's livers. Actually, these are brain dead livers and remove their cells and, uh, and harvest or, or implant uh, genetically engineered cells and to develop uh, or, 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 or to grow a new liver. So it's actually not an artificial liver, it's still a biological liver, but uh, engineered in a different way. But these are still all, uh, all um, a basic, uh, at the basic levels of its development, but it will take a long time for uh, these type of new developments to come into actual practice. Yes, I think there are uh, there are many more questions. Is that okay to forward you? 
I'm fine. I'm okay. <laughs> If you're okay, I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Yeah, Engineer, we will proceed. Thank you, Professor. So the next question is, what yeah. are the high-tech high equipment you need in the operation theater for the liver transplant surgeries as yeah. in their purposes? Yeah, okay. So there are two basic type of, uh, uh, actually there are three basic types of instruments and gadgets that you need for transplants. One is for anesthesia, uh, one is for the surgery, and one is for the post-operative care. Uh, if you look at the anesthesia, because it's a long surgery, sometimes you might get major blood losses. You, you need to balance your parameters very close, very, very, uh, at a very fine range. So you need very close monitoring. So they, they have uh, different type of monitors. They, they look at the heart cardiac output monitor. We, they look at the um, uh, 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 output of the heart during the operation. Then there's something called esophageal Doppler, again, monitoring the, how the heart functions. Then, then they look at uh, how your blood clotting is like, uh, or that is called thromboelastometry, where they keep a close eye on your, uh, on your uh, clotting parameters because it can be the lot during the surgery. And then, you, then there are other parameters like blood gases, uh, look, uh, look at the oxygen level of the blood, pH level of the blood, all these have to be closely monitored. Then uh, I just mentioned a few basic things. And then if you are looking at the operation uh, 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 instrument that are needed for the operation, uh, there's a special gadget that is required to cut the liver, which we call cavitron ultrasonic suction aspirator. And then you get uh, other, other instruments that you uh, use to stop bleeding like argon plasma coagulator, they are, where you spray with argon plasma, argon uh, beam of argon uh, electrocautery, you spray on the liver and you stop the bleeding. Uh, and then there's something called harmonic scalpel where you use uh, 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 to divide again, uh, cut the liver, and then you need fine microscopic instruments and operating microscope. So those are interoperative uh, few things that I mentioned that you need for the surgery. And the, after the operation, uh, the, the patients have to be monitored and managed in a separate ICU because you can't keep these patients with other general patients because uh, uh, the, because the Im immediately after the liver transplant, we put that we bring down the immunity. So they are hi are highly they have a high risk of developing infections. So they have to be monitored in a, uh, a managed in a separate ICU where it's uh, you are trying to maintain uh, um, uh, sterility as much as possible. And then during the recovery period also, you need close monitoring. You need uh, sometimes some of these patients their kidneys might stop working. So you need uh, something called a different type of dialysis, which you call CRRT machine, um, uh, continuous renal replacement therapy. So, and, and different uh, machines that you monitor, heart rate, uh, heart uh, uh, cardiac function. So likewise, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, high tech equipment that, is, that you need specifically for this surgery. question is, uh, this person got a grade one fatty liver before three years and usually do exercises four days per week, average 1.25 hours per day, but still I could not be able to get rid of fatty liver grade one, but haven't done any diet control. How can I get rid of fatty liver? Uh, I, I think I uh, mentioned earlier, you can't do exercise and burn what you take in then you have to keep on doing exercises for the whole day. So the most important thing is to cut down what you take in and then combine that with the exercise uh, uh, program. And just by doing exercise, I, I don't think you will be able to uh, get rid of your, of your fatty liver. But having said that, some of the page, there are still page, there are other factors also that, that, that influences this, uh, especially the genetically, your genetic, genetic Uh, 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 susceptibility. Uh, there are certain patients, no matter how much you uh, are careful, no matter how much you exercise, still your fatty liver uh, will not revert. But most of these patients will not progress. So that is the most important thing. So just to keep it without progression, it's very important that you look at these two aspects. So in for the answer for the question is, uh, the most important thing is not 
the exercise, the diet, which is combined with bit of exercise, not bit of exercise with exercise. Is there a way to identify non-alcoholic liver disease and alcoholic liver disease? Uh, there is no scientific way. There are no tests. But uh, 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 so generally how you divide uh, alcoholic and non-alcoholic is based on the history. So you take the history from the patient and see whether he's taking a significant amount of alcohol and if the patient has got fat liver, you tell, okay, you have got alcoholic fat liver. But this is very crude way because uh, because there, anyway, there are 30%, 40% of our, our population, even if you don't take alcohol, you get fat liver. So if someone like that takes alcohol, you call it, you call he or she an alcoholic fat liver. So it's based on the history. But uh, just uh, there is no scientific way of, or not scientific, no, there is no, there are no tests to say whether to find out whether he developed fat liver because of alcohol or whether he developed fat liver uh, without alcohol. So it's based on the history. But uh, just, just can I just add on to that? Uh, yeah, but very important, uh, the important, very important thing is if you have fatty liver, uh, you should stop alcohol. But we say is even if you take occasional drink on top of fatty liver, it is very, very bad because that at least increases, not at least it increases the chance of you getting liver cancer in the future by 10 times. So it's very important that you does not, do, do not con consume alcohol if you, if you have fatty liver. How treatment we should do body checkup for liver functions? Uh, if, you are, if, your liver, if your liver enzymes are high, if you have a fatty liver, uh, I think you should. I think you should go and meet a hepatologist, not a surgeon. Uh, the the uh, the person should go and meet a liver physician. So that is, if you have fatty liver and if your enzymes are high. But if it is not, if it is not high, uh, it's like uh, you you. There are no guidelines. Uh, none of the guidelines say okay. This is uh, uh, the time period that you should be doing these tests. Uh, but at least uh, my my personal this is my personal life. Yeah, at least I think once in every three to six, uh, uh, three to five years, you should do once in a while ultrasound scan and liver profile. What is the recommended frequency that a fatty liver patient, SGPT forty to eighty, need to observe? Liver through ultrasound scan liver profile. What is the first part? Sorry. What is the recommended frequency that a fatty liver patient, SGPT 40 to 80, need to observe liver through ultrasound scan liver profile? Uh, yeah, generally what, uh, what uh, doctors say is that uh, every six months you should be doing ultrasound scan and generally every uh, three months uh, you should look at your liver profile. Question is, is it okay if a person having fatty liver take vitamin E liver supplements for long period? So again, I mentioned liver supplements are all fancy drugs. Uh, there are no vitamins for liver. Uh, and uh, 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 vitamin E is actually quite popular drug among most of, uh, most of the patients and again, most of the physicians. Uh, but there is no real strong evidence to say that it reverts your liver back to normal. There are a couple of studies that were done. Um, it shows uh, some, some degree of uh, uh, improvement of uh, uh, liver, um, uh, fatty liver, but these are all not very well accepted, very, uh, with very strong evidence. So as a general statement, uh, 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 this uh, vitamin E and other, other, other vitamins, liver supplements, they have a very, very limited role uh, to play with uh, regards to fatty liver. The 
next question is what is the risk age group for li liver profile to regular leader uh, what, is, what is the risk age group yeah, uh, there is no risk age group but the age that you detect fatty liver has uh, come down over the years but nowadays even uh, even uh, children uh, adolescents and young adults all these uh, all these uh, uh, groups of people uh, patients are, uh, are detected with fatty liver so there is no risk age uh, but uh, more than the age what is important is uh, uh, your lifestyle Next question is, is that the GOSL, does it have any strategy of awareness program of fatty liver to young generation and children? And we see a lot of chubby children are pres presenting in the public media, not respecting the skinny children are to be get involved. Uh, yes, that is true. That is true. And still, there is no... Uh... It is not included in non. Now there are non-communicable non -communicable diseases. List of non-communicable diseases in uh, in Sri Lanka like pressure, diabetes, uh, you know, condition hypercholesteremia. Uh, but uh, still, fatty liver has not been included. Now, now actually, very soon it will come up uh, in our list of non-communicable diseases. It will be discussed now, uh, but uh, it will come up. But still, uh, at the moment, it is not included. And I think this is a very, very important area that uh, people should be discussing because it is not a disease, uh, a single disease. It's a group of a lot of diseases. And if you have fatty liver, you are prone to get other problems as well. And it is completely preventable. It's going to be a huge problem in the future. So because I think it should be included. Next question is, what are the side effects of taking Aldactone, Aldactone, Aldactone tablets, long period for uh, cirrhosis. Uh, okay, Aldactone, uh, Aldactone you give uh, because I said earlier, when you have cirrhosis, the water gets collected in your body. To get rid of this excess water, you give Aldactone. Um, so, uh, uh, but if you, when you take Aldactone, there are other side effects of this. Uh, of aldactone like some of these patients they, they might get cramps um, and uh, they get something called gynecomastia where you get pain uh, in the nipples so there are two common uh, two, uh, two commonly described side effects but there are other other rare ones um, but they there are ways of treating this and there are other alternatives uh, if someone gets that again uh, if uh, probably the person who have asked this question uh, maybe he knows someone or maybe he has a problem. So I think you get you should go and meet a hepatologist again. Uh, he might be able to help you with uh, alternative or, uh, or maybe to change the dose so that the side effects are controlled. Next question is, what are the main causes of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in Sri Lanka? Uh, the main cause, uh, not uh, the main causes, the main cause is too much eating and less, uh, no exercise. So that is the main cause. But uh, there are other factors also that affect, uh, that might influence developing fatty liver. One is genetics. Uh, and, and especially South Asians, Indians, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, this is a, this, in this people in this region, people have found out there are certain genes in, uh, in, uh, uh, with us. And because of these genes, we are at high risk of developing fatty liver. And that is why we see a lot of patients with fatty liver in this part of the world. So that is the second uh, uh, important thing, genetic susceptibility. And also alcohol can also lead uh, to fatty liver up to a certain extent. So these are the three main causes for developing fatty liver. Very often, the liver enzymes return to normal with extensive exercising and proper diet. Does it mean that liver is on the way to recovery? 
Yes. So that's the first indicator of your liver recovery. When you adhere to your diet, it comes back to normal. But what happens with most of us is uh, you go back to your previous desires and you can't resist. And most of the time, patients, uh, people, uh, uh, you, your enzymes get better and your ultrasound uh, fatty liver actually comes back to normal and then you go back, slowly go back to your, you forget this and go back to your usual diet and it comes back again. That is the problem. But yes, that's an indicator. Then your liver enzymes come down. That's an indicator that your liver is recovering. Uh, as I know, uh, women in Sri Lanka are having fatty liver more than the men. What is the scientific reason behind that? Is it due to bad food practices? Uh, uh, exact reason, I'm not sure why, why it is uh, a little higher. Uh, but I think probably the same diet that the men and women take. Uh, if you look at uh, the same thing that you eat and probably uh, maybe the degree of exercise uh, that uh, the two, two sexes have uh, compared to men, compared to women. Uh, but except for I'm not sure. This person has grade 2 fatty liver and SGPT level more than 75 for three years. And uh, his upper abdomen is hurting at right side for two years. How can uh, he recover from that? Mm, well, uh, uh, as a general statement, fat liver uh, most of the time is asymptomatic. It does not cause any symptoms. But there are sometimes you can you see uh, some patients with bit of right side pain uh, when they have fat liver. But this type of pain that they describe is not actually very sort of strong pain. It's a mild discomfort uh, type of a uh, pain, more than really a pain. So that's a general symptom of uh, uh, fatty liver. But if someone is having long-standing pain, and if it is significant pain, uh, then then uh, then generally uh, we look at other causes. It could be something else. Probably might uh, think of something in uh, you know you had you generally might think of other cause. So if someone has a long-standing pain which is not settling, uh, uh, it's better that you you meet someone. Uh, or a physician or a, uh, 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 a doctor and uh, and uh, see whether there is something else. That's all from my end. Uh, Engineer Narangoda, I think uh, you have a question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Engineer Lakmini. So that, that question was asked by you, but that's okay. I have another question, not from me, from one of my friends. Uh, <laughs> that's if you're having a simple fatty liver symptoms, the alcoholic consumption will be a problem. <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you can, is it okay to have an occasional drink? So that's a question. Uh, well, uh, uh, so I can I can tell her uh, what I can tell is scientific facts. So if you look at only scientific facts, uh, what is recommended is uh, if you have people have looked into this um, and people have followed up and uh, uh, patients with uh, people with fatty liver and uh, and they have looked at uh, people who develop cancer with long-standing fatty liver. There's a big study that was done in Japan. Uh, about 25,000 patients with fatty liver, they have followed up for a certain period of time. And then some of them developed cancer. And then they looked at the causes, risk factors to develop cancer. And what they have found is uh, alcohol is the main risk factor to develop cancer. And because of that, uh, there are not only one study, there are multiple studies. They, they say not to take alcohol, even in small amounts. So having said that, it's up to you to decide uh, whether once in a while, uh, drink is okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you, doctor. Uh, it's a long day for you. I know that you are really uh, tired, but uh, we would like to give a few questions, opportunities to the audience for his end. Please, uh, your chance to get a consultation. 
from the professor dr ron sirivarthana today for 5 minutes we can give opportunity audience if you have any more questions uh, you can speak and ask now you can take this opportunity because we know that uh, most of our engineers is working with stress and having bad food practices and as per my knowledge more than 50% of engineers are having some kind of a fatigue liver symptoms so that really bad that because of bad practices bad behaviors bad desires so we got a good uh, like uh, warn from you today honestly to correct ourselves immediately i know our audience got the right message uh, audience please we can uh, we can give you opportunity for few questions if you have please so if no more uh, engineer lakmini we can go towards the latter part uh, to wind up the session today with a lot of thanks shall we move words um, mr anand uh, thank you uh, professor rohan for the interesting session and we had so many questions uh, with and uh, in this session and uh, now it's time for wrap up the session so i will invite engineer kaushal patirana to uh, deliver the vote of thanks thank you engineer lakmini good evening i'm kaushal patan from building service engineering sectional committee um well wow it was quite an informative and timely interesting session i believe that you all have captured very valuable lessons to stay healthy and enjoy enjoy the webinar as we are reaching to the end of the lecture i am here to present the vote of thank on behalf of the organizing committee first i would like to provide our sincere sincere gratitude for the guest speaker today professor rohan sirivardhana for sparing us time at this very challenging time and enlightening us with a load of knowledge i shall thank engineer sampath godamano who introduced and communicated with professor rohan and creating a platform for this event um then i would like to thank the isl staff for providing the facilities and arranging the webinar successful uh last but not least our sincere gratitude for all uh, for actively participating to this webinar before winding up i would like to invite you for upcoming public lectures and other events organized by the building service engineering sectional committee for the session 2020-21 we will inform further details in due course okay well then we are looking forward to see you all soon in next events wishing you a pleasant evening stay safe stay strong and save lives thank you <laughs>